Coming up today on Retire Smarter, we untangled the new required minimum distribution rules for beneficiaries. Sifting through the 260 pages of final regulations issued just a few months ago, we identify what's important for you and your family as you consider your options on your estate and current tax situation. Welcome to another edition of Retire Smarter. Walter Storholtz here alongside Tyler Emmerich, a certified financial planner and chartered financial analyst with the True Wealth Design team. Uh, we have a great episode today as we yeah, try to make a little bit of sense out of those RMD rules for beneficiaries. And uh, boy, Tyler, this has been in the works for many years at this point. All got kicked off before the pandemic, which just feels like so long ago. <laughs> and they keep tweaking and adjusting this thing. So that's going to be uh, fun to dive in with you on this topic. Looking forward to that. In the meantime, though, we... Uh, I don't know. We've officially turned the page to, to September and fall, and it seems like we're heading in the in a good direction here weather-wise, and just enjoying this time of year. No, no, it's great. I mean, this past weekend was the first weekend of, uh, of football, um, so we're big high State fans uh, in our family. Don't get too much into the pro sports. I know Kevin talks about his beloved Steelers quite a bit on the podcast when he's here, um, but uh, for me, it's, a, it's all college, uh, college football and, and our Buckeyes, so... Although, you know, jumping on the bandwagon of the Browns and Bengals, if uh, any sports fans out there in Ohio, it's, uh, you know, Bengals have been all right here as of late, but uh, it doesn't seem like their either team had a great start to the year. So we'll stick with our college teams. <laughs> yeah, definitely not as good of a start as uh, Ohio State has had. So <laughs> no, no, fingers crossed Ohio State uh, can get it done this year. But uh, yeah, so spend a lot of time with the family this weekend, watch a little football. Our weather was pretty good, but boy, fall is going to be around the corner. So yeah. we'll be picking up leaves and doing yard work here before you know it yeah uh, those good times will certainly be ahead so have, have you had your first pumpkin spice latte of the season yet? <laughs> i have not i have not <laughs> but in a um a few weeks we have some friends coming in town from uh texas and uh the first thing they brought up was like hey can we go to a pumpkin patch i was like hey sure <laughs> so nice. we got uh we got the pumpkin patch scheduled and all the fun fall festivities uh kind of planned at least for uh for a weekend here coming up but but no pumpkin spice lattes as of right now at, at least maybe some uh, some cider is in your future it sounds like so yes that's absolutely absolutely well i'm a big well we do pumpkin bars in our family like kind of like a pumpkin roll oh yeah um, okay. not uh -huh. a great calling but uh my favorite desserts are some of the pumpkin uh but you got to have that cream cheese icing mm. uh my wife tried to make uh, her pumpkin bars with uh that frosted icing and uh it's just not the same the cream cheese is where it's at Nice. <laughs> Not I, to get I'm, too random and off track. You get me talking about food. I could do that. I'm a big hey, pumpkin we'll have a whole pie fan, and, and, but I'm liking the sound of these pumpkin bars. So, oh yes, P pumpkin bars. Yeah, just think of uh, think of uh, pumpkin flavored cake, I guess, and then. Um, cream cheese icing on top with a little bit of pecans. Yeah, so. that's not very hard to convince someone to eat that, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, trust me, I eat a few of them. Uh, I can normally get her to cook it a couple, at least a couple of times uh, nice. in the fall. But, nice, yeah. very cool. Well, we will uh, look forward to hearing about how the pumpkin patch visit goes in a couple of weeks. Uh, in the meantime, mm -hmm. though, let's turn our attention to these RMDs, way more exciting than going to the pumpkin patch. Yeah. And uh, rules for beneficiaries, and, and I kind of mentioned, Tyler, I mean, goodness gracious, this thing's been in the works since the original SECURE Act back before the pandemic in 2019, and it's seen lots right. of changes and iterations since then. And gosh, it's hard to, I mean, I, I guess if they kept that nomenclature of SECURE Act, SECURE Act 2.0, I don't know what mm -hmm. this one would be. It'd be like software at this point, SECURE Act, <laughs> you know, right, 7.11 or something <laughs> like that. It's definitely getting up there. Yeah. Um, they're, and, and, they're timing the release with each new iOS update. Like <laughs> iOS 18 is coming out, are. so we needed it a is. new SECURE Act update, right? <laughs> That's Sounds about right. Um, and these aren't insignificant changes. I mean, going back to that, the Secure Act in 2019, as, as you had mentioned, I mean, boy, I mean, they, they made some sweeping changes to required minimum distributions, um, certainly for individuals that inherit qualified retirement accounts. They changed uh, your distribution rules that you have to follow for a lot of those individuals. And then also, you know, today we're going to talk quite a bit about inheriting accounts and, you know, some of those rules. But, you know, Secure Act um, in 2019 also had some pretty substantial changes around just normal required minimum distributions and retirement plans in general. But the major change uh, back then in 2019 um, that we're going to 
sort of springboard off of uh, as we kind of look at those final re- regulations that were issued uh, back in July of this year. It has everything to do with this idea of changing the stretch treatment of post-death distributions for you know, most non-spouse beneficiaries where they're now kind of subject to this um, so-called 10-year rule, which requires beneficiaries of qualified retirement accounts to fully distribute inherited retirement accounts by the end of the 10th year following the original account owner's death. So, um, you know, no more stretching out payments over your lifetime. Hey, 10 years and you got to get that money out, which is a very, very substantial change. And then we fast forward a couple years from 2019. We're getting into 2022 now. The IRS, you know, felt the need to issue or some proposed regulation changes to that SECURE Act or some more commentary on their thoughts and the actual application of the legislation. Uh, that didn't get passed. It was just um, proposed. And then now we fast forward all the way to uh, July, uh, just a few months ago, they actually confirmed some of those changes that were proposed or some of those regulations that were proposed. As we you know, kind of alluded to in the lead in, 260 pages of clarification. Uh, so there's quite a bit packed into there. <laughs> No kidding. I mean, that's just a lot to sort through for an original document, let alone a, an amendment to it or an update to it. Right. No, it, the regulations definitely introduce some more complexity to the process of tax planning around your retirement accounts. There's there's no doubt about it. Specifically, you know, for the death um, after the death of the account on, the original account owner. So we wanted to kind of peel back the onion on you know some of those pages and what we feel is uh, you know important to some of the listeners. By no means are we going to be able to cover everything uh, that are in those final regulations, but we're going to kind of sift through what we think uh, is going to be important and. T- some of the big highlights for you here today. Now, before we dive too far, you know, this wording, as with most legislation, if you've ever you know, got into it, the wording can get a little bit wonky, certainly can get confusing, and you know, just some minor d- differences between some of the language that I'm going to be using here can matter quite a bit. So I'll do my best to be clear on you know, kind of uh, what we're talking about and who we're actually talking about, but um, you know, pay special attention to that as you're kind of listening through here. And you know, one of the, terminolo- the terminology that I've kind of brought up and we've, we've talked about already here is this idea of well, who is this affecting and, and why? And, you know, specifically, I think it's important to realize that we're, we're kind of zeroing in on what we call qualified retirement accounts. So think about individual retirement accounts or IRAs, Roth accounts, you know, things like that. Um, you know, these rules are not applicable to taxable brokerage accounts or savings accounts or your house or anything like that. So we're being very specific on, you know, what these rules are pertaining to. IRA accounts, Roth accounts, and you know, other any other qualified retirement account that you might have. Now, the reason why these rules become so imperative is because they have some ramifications on your tax planning and uh, certainly some ramifications on your estate planning and how you're thinking through, well, you know, who might inherit these accounts? What might their tax situation look like? And how might these accounts affect them? Um, for anybody who has, uh, you know, had to you know, handle an estate or maybe an, inherited some retirement accounts from, you know, loved ones, friends, family, whatever the case is, um, and you're still working, and then you start having to do some of these distributions, that can that can throw quite a bit of a wrinkle in your tax situation. So, you know, understanding these rules will absolutely help you, you know, plan through your estate and certainly you know, help give you some insight into maybe, you know, doing Roth conversions or the positioning of uh, the accounts and, and where your money's currently being held. So that's why it's important. Tax ramifications and, and some of the estate planning uh, lens that we're looking through here. Now, there's also a couple definitions that we need to know. So that original SECURE Act, going, you know, going back uh, to 2019, what it did is, you know, it, it separated out uh, the old group of what we call designated beneficiaries into two subcategories. So, you know, prior to 2019, you know, normally there were what we call two groups of beneficiaries. There are what's called a designated beneficiary and a non-designated beneficiary. Non-designated beneficiaries are things like charities, estates, you know, non-see-through trusts. So they're, they're things that really aren't apl- applicable for the 
the vast majority of us. So we're going to kind of forget about these non-designated beneficiaries. We're not going to talk too much about them today. We're going to try to focus on this idea of a designated beneficiary, which I think is going to be applicable to most of our listeners. So that SECURE Act, what it did is it looked at those designated beneficiaries and broke them into two subcategories. And they said, all right, there's going to be what's called eligible designated beneficiaries and non-eligible designated beneficiaries. So what are these categories and who falls into each? The eligible designated beneficiaries is a, a, a much more finite list. And what I mean by that is it's specific circumstances that qualify you to be an eligible designated beneficiary. Um, these are individuals like surviving spouses, disabled persons, chronically ill persons, individuals that are 10 years younger uh, than the decedent, minor children, and some see-through trust. So that is the list to be an eligible designated beneficiary. If you are an individual that would fall in one of those categories and you inherit a qualified retirement account, then the SECURE Act really didn't do much changes for you. You still have the ability to, once you inherit a retirement account, to stretch payments out over your lifetime. And surviving spouses, actually, not to add to the complexity, they have a few more options as well. Uh, We're not going to get too far into those, but these eligible designated beneficiaries, the SECURE Act separated them out and there wasn't much changes for them. What we're going to focus on is the idea of these non-eligible designated beneficiaries. That's the second group. All I'm doing is adding non in front of eligible. (laughs) (laughs) It's a mouthful to be able to say, right? But these non-eligible beneficiaries are essentially most individuals that are not or non-spouse beneficiaries, right? Which is the vast majority of us are going to are going to fall into this category. And what the Secure Act did is said, hey, if you fall into this category, now you have this ten-year rule uh, that you need to follow. No longer can you stretch payments out over your lifetime. Um, you have to have your account that you inherit distributed. Basically, has to be zero balance by December thirty-first of the tenth year after you inherit the retirement account. So basically you got 10 years to get that account balanced down to zero. And that was really the gist of the rule. Pretty easy, not much that you needed to do there to comply with that. You following me so far, Walt? How are we doing? Following you so far. Eligible beneficiaries and non-eligible. I just wish there was like a better, uh, some some better lettering here so these were easier to follow, you know, like N. NDB and EDB, they just they just don't roll off the tongue as easy. Come on, Walter, are you throwing some more acronyms at me here? Does our industry need more acronyms? We got so many, we might as well lean into it, right? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but in itself, I don't think that's all that complex, right? It's like saying, hey, if you're, you know, most beneficiaries that aren't spouses, okay, the vast majority of us are going to have to have any account that we inherit, that's a retirement account, distributed by 10 years. Now, as you think about that, I mean, why might that be impactful? Well, if we think about inheriting these retirement accounts, a lot of times, or most of the times, especially in the case of an IRA, um, you haven't paid taxes or the individual hadn't paid taxes on that money yet. So what the IRS is essentially saying um, is, hey, with the requirement that you have to have that account distributed within 10 years, you know, they're saying, all right, now you're going to have to pull that money out and actually pay taxes on it. Um, and there was no re- restrictions on like having to pull out money each year, you could literally let that money sit. And then at the end of 10 years, pull it all out. And then, you know, whatever balance that was would then, you know, hit your tax return and then you would have to pay taxes on it. But the the idea here is the government saying, hey, these are really nice accounts. We don't want you to be able to keep money in them forever. Um, We want you to have to distribute them. So in the case of the IRA, that's taxable to you. Certainly, if you inherit a Roth account, you know, that's, uh, that's great. Those distributions would not be taxable to you when you have to pull them out. But of course, we got to remember, what's the benefit of having a Roth? Well, those earnings that you get in there are all tax-free. So ideally, if you were to inherit a Roth um, prior to the SECURE Act, you could kind of let it stay in there. You'd have small distributions, those required minimums each year. But, you know, you could let that money sit in that Roth for the enti- rest of your life with small distributions and let those earnings keep growing tax-free. The IRS doesn't want us to be able to do that anymore. And that's the spirit of this 
law that was introduced or this 10 year rule back uh, in the secure act. And, you know, in February of 2022, um, when they introduced that those proposed regulations that were then finalized and confirmed, you know, a few months ago, you know, the change that they made uh, was specifically for these non eligible designated beneficiaries, or these individuals that are subject to that 10 year rule. Uh, and they added one other layer of complexity. Uh, they said, okay, now what we have to do is if you fall in that category and you're under that 10-year rule now we have to also look at the individual who had passed and were they actually or did they pass before their required beginning date or did they pass after their required beginning date now the terminology they use here required beginning date what they're referring to is that original owners required minimum distributions right um, these were you know the age when you actually have to start pulling money out of your retirement accounts you know it's going can be 73 to 75 depending on when you were born currently um, but if the individual that you inherited the account for passed away before their they started their uh, required minimum distributions or said another way, these required beginning date, uh, then you have the 10 year rule only. However, uh, if the individual you inherited the account from was actually over 73, 75, or potentially even a little bit younger in some random cir circumstances, and they were actually pulling out those required minimum distributions, and then they pass. Well, now what happens is, is, Hey, you still got to follow this 10 year rule. However, you're going to actually have to start doing required minimum distributions during that 10 years. So each year you're actually are going to have a small amount that you're going to have to distribute from these qualified retirement accounts. Um, and then you still on the back end, hey, within 10 years, you have to have uh, that account zeroed out and have a zero balance. So they kind of added in that other niche saying, all right, hey, we're not going to let you just stretch it over over 10 years and do zero payments over that time period. You're going to have to do some required minimum distributions. And then also at the end of that 10 years, you're going to have to have the account balance at zero. So added in another kind of layer of complexity there. Yeah, it's like an onion. Just keep peeling back the layers to these rules. <laughs> yes. And and uh, on the show notes, Vault, you can kind of see we got this uh, kind of got a label as an this IRA chart, man. beneficiary yep. tree. Yes. Um, I think it's, uh, what, four layers down, five layers down, uh, depending on your circumstances here. Um, so you know, you'd really need to make sure um, that you understand what your situation is um, and what options are going to be afforded to you if you inherit one of these accounts. And certainly for individuals that are going to have a substantial estate uh, or not even necessarily a substantial estate, but a decent amount of money that's going to pass through their estate through these qualified retirement accounts, you know, there's going to be quite a bit of planning opportunity here as we kind of think through the effect of these new laws or this new rule. Uh, that was confirmed. Now, the thing is, is, well, when does this start? Um, you know, when they um, did these regulations, essentially, they said, all right, hey, we're already, you know, a, a handful of years in here, when are these required minimum distributions going to actually need to begin for these non eligible designated uh, beneficiaries? And that will go into effect starting next year in 2025. So they're not going to backdate any of those required minimum distributions for you know, 21, 22, 23, and 24. So this is gonna be effective starting in 2025. Now, just because those required minimum distributions are gonna start in 2025, that doesn't reset that 10 year clock for a beneficiary who inherited that retirement account, you know, between 2020 and 2023, your 10 years is still going to go from that original date. It's just saying, Hey, now in 2025, you're going to have to start pulling out required minimum distributions from that inherited uh, retirement account. So I think the big caveat there, that is the big rule change that we wanted to kind of express and, you know, make sure, you know, that listeners were you know aware of and, and just had it on their radar, certainly as you're talking to your financial professional and you kind of think through like, well, how does this affect our estate plan? Or certainly if you're an individual that has one of these inherited retirement accounts that you've gotten in the last few years, well, understanding, all right, hey, what are the, what, what are the new rules that I need to follow starting in 2025 and just being prepared, uh, then that's, uh, that's going to be key. Because of course, if, if you have these required minimum distributions and you do not take them, well, of course, we might be looking at uh, penalties and, and the like uh, if we don't get them out of the account. Now, 
you know, as we had mentioned here, right, many, many pages in the, uh, the finalized regulations, you know, there were a handful of other things that I'd like to kind of bring up um, that are off to the side uh, that are maybe a little bit of one-offs um, that I feel would be helpful for some of the listeners and, you know, might apply um, to someone listening. So the first of which is the idea of a surviving spouse and, you know, what your options are when you inherit one of these qualified retirement accounts. Now, of course, being a spouse, you actually have, you know, quite a few even more options than what we've dove into today. Um, But they introduced this concept, um, which had some pretty significant opposition, uh, this concept of hypothetical required minimum distributions. So what this is, um, is the idea that to the extent the surviving spouse initially uses the 10 year rule, surviving spouses don't have to, but there are some circumstances where it might, might make sense. But if they start out saying, Hey, we're going to utilize this 10 year rule and that's what we're going to follow. And then the surviving spouse later decides that, well, no, I'd actually like to treat the deceased spouse's IRA like my own, right? So just move it over into my own retirement account. This is what's called a spousal rollover. Um, then first, they need to make up any of those required minimum distributions that would have had to been taken hypothetically in their IRA all along. So this is again just getting back to that quirkiness that you know the spouses have a few different options uh, as they think about inheriting accounts uh, from their spouse. And this one is this rule is kind of there to to circumvent some of the playing of hey, I don't have to take required minimum distributions. Maybe you're of a certain age to where if you were to move them over into your own retirement account, you would be subject to required minimum distributions because you are over, say, 73 or 75. Um, You know, this little hypothetical RMD language there is trying to prevent individuals from saying, well, hey, I'm going to go 10-year rules, no RMDs for that time. And then at the end of the 10-year rules, and kind of roll it over into their own IRA and kind of avoid, you know, hist- those RMDs that would have been required uh, if they had them in their own account under their own name. So a little bit of quirkiness there, um, but, you know, I think that's going to impact some individuals on maybe how they're utilizing uh, their inherited accounts from a spouse. The other thing that I would like to bring up is this idea of what's called successor beneficiaries. So this is a, a situation to where you are the beneficiary of a beneficiary account. Okay. So we're going even down another layer, right? <laughs> I told you. So onion. it's like, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So it's like, hey, you know, you, you inherit uh, or, you know, a family member inherits account from their parents and then that family member passes and then you inherit that account from them, right? So this is, this is that uh, situation. It's called successor beneficiaries. And boy, there's quite a bit of complexity here and a lot of what if. So the decision tree on this one is uh, substantially larger than even the one that you're staring at Walt, for our general uh, yeah. uh, general and the starter discussion. But there are a couple blanket statements that can be made about these rules uh, for these individuals. Now, assuming that the original beneficiary died you know, after the SECURE Act's effective date, uh, these two rules are you know, if the original beneficiary was stretching distributions, right? then the successor beneficiary will become subject to the 10 year rule. Second one is if the original beneficiary was subject to the 10 year rule, then the successor beneficiary will finish out the original beneficiary's 10 year period. So it doesn't start a new period. So if they inherited an account, um, they, they were under the 10 year rules, five years in, they pass away and you inherit that account. Well, then you got five years left to get it out. It's not like you have a new clock, uh, or a new 10 year period to get it out. So unique circumstances, a couple of unique situations here. Um, but a little bit of change from what was in the past. That, and that the family final, tree is looking like one that's had a lot of divorces <laughs> and remarriages. It's getting, it getting, can get getting complex, little, right? Little complex, um, yeah. yes, it, it can get complex pretty quickly. And then the, the final one I want to bring up is this idea of, of the RMD age. So we're kind of changing gears a little bit. Everything that we talked about before was really, you know, focused on inheriting accounts, right? But of course, there are required minimum distributions for individuals in your own personal retirement accounts. And of course, Congress was rushing to pass that SECURE Act 2.0 uh, on the closing days of like 2022. So that was the second iteration, the 2.0 of the original SECURE Act back in 2019. Um, they let a significant drafting error kind of slip through on the final vote. And the law's provision had a, a step up age for required minimum distribution. So it went from like 72, they pushed it out to 73, and then you know, eventually to 75. But they accidentally specified that people born in 1959 
would be required to begin RMDs at two ages, 73 and 75. Um, talk about confusing. Well, well, hey, I have two ages yeah. when I actually have to start pulling out money. Well, which is it? Uh, so they actually clarified that and said, hey, p- individuals that were born in 1959 will actually be required to begin RMDs at the age of 73. So that kind of had some finite to it. And now we have some clarity. So, you know, as you're kind of thinking about your own situation, uh, if you're retired and you're coming up on re- RMD age, you know, over the last handful of years here, so there's been some changes to that. I mean, our, RMD age used to start at 70 and a half. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, but ve- now, it very quickly went from 70 and a half to several other ages in it, just it, the past few years. It did. It did. So, you know, to kind of simplify that for the listeners here, essentially under the new rules, if you were born in 1950 or earlier, you know, 72 would have been your RMD age. If you were born from 1951 to 1959, 73 is your required minimum distribution age. And then of course, if you were born in 1960 or later, then your required minimum distribution age is age 75. So that's kind of what we're working with now and Walt, until they decide to make some other changes um, down the road. Yeah, hopefully they settle on that for a little while because it was getting a little annoying when it was 70 and a half and then 72, then 73, then 75. It's Sure. Let's settle on a number for a while here, folks. Let's Yeah, well, and it's a it's a big planning opportunity, yeah. right? I mean, you start looking at some of these projections and these plans and you look at individual situation now uh, and then kind of fast forward to when these required minimum distributions uh, begin. You know, a lot of families are kind of shocked a little bit to see how much uh, the distributions have to be and and kind of how it affects their tax situation at that time um you know it's kind of hard to think that far down the road and well what are the real dollars and what what is this impact going to be for you uh but when you kind of see it uh, visually which we go through with a lot of the families that we work with you know it really can give you some insight of course we don't know what's going to happen with tax legislation but we can use our best guess and use what's under current law and you know these required minimum distributions when you have to begin them, especially for individuals that have large retirement accounts that they have not paid taxes on yet, you know, it can be pretty impactful. Um, and we try to do quite a bit of planning around that. You know, as I think about what we covered today and thinking through beneficiaries and inheriting some of these accounts, whether it's you that inherit them or, you know, family members that will inherit accounts from you, you know, that same problem arises, right? When you start thinking about inheriting these accounts and having to do distributions, how does that impact your tax situation? And, you know, are there things that you can do now to kind of, you know, give good old Uncle Sam the least amount of money as possible, certainly within the rules, right? But, you know, no reason to give them more than their fair share. Pretty impressive. Thanks for reading that 200 plus pages for us. So we didn't have to uh, really, really appreciate you saving yeah, us some time. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> some of the highlights from that legislation. And as yeah. you said, I'm sure there will be another update uh, in the future that we'll have to break down again here on the show. Hopefully not, but maybe, maybe yeah, that'll they, be it. Keep us on our toes for sure. Yeah, they do. They do. Well, hey, if you've got questions for Tyler, you want to get in touch and uh, talk a little bit about maybe RMDs that you're facing. Have you planned properly for them in the future? Well, if not, uh, get in touch with Tyler and the team at True Wealth Design. A couple of ways that you can get in touch pretty easily. One is to go to truewealthdesign.com. Click on the Are We Right For You button, and that lets you schedule an introductory call. It's just a 15-minute conversation or so with an experienced advisor on the team. See if you're a good fit to work with one another, and then take the conversation from there. Again, you can sign up for that at truewealthdesign.com and click the Are We Right For You button. You can also call 855-TWD-PLAN. That's 855-TWD-PLAN. And we've put all the contact info you need in the description of today's show so you can find it easily. Tyler, great episode today. Thanks for the insight, and we'll catch up with you again soon. You got it. Have a good one, Walt. All right, take care. That's Tyler Emmerich. I'm Walter Stroll. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Retire Smarter. Information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Information is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accurateness and completeness cannot be guaranteed. All performance reference is historical and not an indication of future results. Benchmark indices are hypothetical and do not include any investment fees.